Welcome to the Canadian Cancer Survivorship Research Consortium Rounds. Um, before we get started, I'll just introduce myself. Uh, my name is Cynthia Kendall, and I'll just be the moderator for this session. I'm a research associate with the Cancer Outcomes Research Program in Halifax at the Nova Scotia Health Authority. I actually work with Dr. Robin Urquhart, who was originally supposed to moderate the session. Um, unfortunately, um, Robin wasn't able to attend today. She had a scheduling conflict, but she um, asked me to step in for her, which I was very happy to do because we have an excellent presentation today. So our presenter today is Perry Tuttleman. She'll be talking to us about her work on pain and childhood cancer survivors. So Perry is a PhD student in clinical psychology at Dalhousie University. Her research is based at the Center for Pediatric Pain Research at the IWK Health Center with Dr. Christine Chambers. Her clinical and research interests include pain and pediatric oncology, uh, family factors in pediatric pain, patient engagement, and knowledge translation. She's supported by the Vanier Canada Graduate Scholarship awarded by CIHR, and she was also the 2017 recipient of the Colleen Elliott Award for Excellence in Cancer Research from the Nova Scotia Health Research Foundation. Um, so Perry's been doing some really great work, and I'm really excited for her to present it today. Um, Perry, I'll just hand it over to you. Fantastic. Can you hear me all right? Yep, I can hear you great. Okay, perfect. Um, so I just want to start off by thanking the CCSRC for having me today to speak about my work in pain and childhood cancer survivors. And I also want to thank um, Dr. Robin Urquhart for inviting me to give this presentation. Robin is a member of my dissertation committee and I've worked with her closely on the qualitative study that I'm going to present to you in this webinar today. So in today's presentation, I'm going to start off with a brief introduction and some background on how I became involved in this area of research. I'll then provide um, an overview of the current literature on pain and childhood cancer survivorship. And then I'll share some findings from a study that I just completed on the lived experience of pain in childhood cancer survivorship. And um, finally, I'm going to discuss a study that we've just started um, where we're using an experimental pain paradigm to advance our understanding of pain and sensory processing in childhood cancer survivors. So as Cynthia mentioned, I'm a PhD student and Vanier Scholar in Clinical Psychology at Dalhousie University in beautiful Halifax. Um, I'm originally from Vancouver and I've slowly made my way east for school uh, with a four year stop in Ontario for my undergraduate degree at McMaster. My PhD supervisor is Dr. Christine Chambers, who is a Canada Research Chair in Children's Pain based at Dalhousie and the IWK Health Centre. Our research is based at the Center for Pediatric Pain Research at the IWK Health Center. Um, and the Center for Pediatric Pain Research is really an international leader in children's pain. Uh, there are six world-class faculty associated with the center who bring expertise from a number of disciplines, such as anesthesia, psychology and neuroscience, as well as nursing. And there's a number of active research programs going on at the center, which broadly focus on ways to better understand, assess and manage children's pain across various ages and diagnoses. So from infancy to adolescence, um, my research program is based in uh, pediatric oncology, but there's other active programs based in arthritis and, and other conditions. Within the center, there's also a growing focus on knowledge translation and implementation science related to moving pediatric pain research uh, directly into clinical care. The IWK Health Center is the sole pediatric tertiary care facility in the Maritimes, and it serves children and families from across the Atlantic provinces. The Chambers Lab is located in the Children's Building of the IWK. And within our lab space, we have participant testing rooms, which are equipped with really fantastic equipment where we can run experimental pain studies, which has been a primary focus of our lab over the past several years. As I mentioned, my PhD work to date has broadly focused on understanding um, pediatric cancer pain across the disease trajectory. And so I'll explain a little bit about um, my involvement in this area and how it led me to research on pain and childhood cancer survivorship. 
Before we go any further, I want to take a moment to define what we mean by pain. It's something that many of us commonly experience, but it's not often that we stop to actually think about how to explain pain or how to put our experiences into words. Pain is defined by the International Association for the Study of Pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. I think this definition of pain is really important because it clarifies that pain is not merely a physical sensation, but that it's also a perception that incorporates emotional components and that that's an integral component of the definition. It also focuses on both actual or potential tissue damage, which has led to a conceptualization of pain as a signal of bodily threat. From an evolutionary perspective, acute pain confers an important evolutionary advantage. Um, pain is regarded as the body's alarm system, and it serves a protective function um, to bring actual or potential tissue damage to our awareness. Pain's important because it tells us to take action. So whether it's just a minor adjustment in our chair because we're feeling uncomfortable um, or mobilizing us to seek medical attention. Pain as a signal of threat is particularly salient in the context of childhood cancer. Each year in Canada, approximately 950 children under the age of 15 are diagnosed with cancer. And pain is regarded as one of the most common and distressing symptoms associated with the disease, according to both children and their parents. For many children, pain, such as headache, abdominal pain, or bone pain, was an initial symptom that led to medical investigation, ultimately resulting in a cancer diagnosis. Pain often continues for children, with 45 to 86 percent of kids reporting pain over the course of their treatments. Sources of cancer-related pain can be diverse, and so for children with cancer, pain may be the result of medical treatments like chemotherapy, radiation or immunotherapy, skin breaking procedures like blood draws or port accesses, uh, lumbar punctures or surgery, or the disease itself, like tumor-related nerve compression. Last year, we published a study in the Clinical Journal of Pain that examined the prevalence and characteristics of pain in children with cancer and the strategies that parents use to manage their children's pain. 230 parents of children with cancer took part in an online survey for this study. And parents were eligible to take part if they had a child between the ages of 0 to 18 who were either currently on active treatment for cancer or who had completed their treatment. One of the most striking findings from this study was that on average, both parents of children on active treatment and parents of children who had completed treatment reported that their children experienced clinically significant levels of pain in the past month, which is defined as a rating of 3 out of 10 or higher. Indeed, the long-term sequela of childhood cancer are well documented. Today, with advancements in therapies, more than 80% of children diagnosed with cancer are expected to survive. But nevertheless, childhood cancer survivors are at risk for a number of late effects of treatment, and they must be vigilant for signs of recurrence or a secondary cancer. Um, the statistics vary, but about two out of three childhood cancer survivors between the ages of five to 19 have a chronic health condition, and we know that the cumulative incidence of chronic conditions increases for this population over time. For childhood cancer survivors, adverse health, health outcomes most commonly affect um, the pulmonary, endocrine, cardiac, and neurocognitive functioning. But in recent years, there's been a growing recognition of pain as a challenge after childhood cancer. Pain as a late effect has been described in the adult cancer survivorship literature for quite some time. 
For instance, in a systematic review of physical symptoms experienced by survivors of the most common adult cancers, breast, gynecological, prostate, and rectal or col colorectal cancer survivors, pain was in the top three. Long-term follow-up studies on the physical health of adult cancer survivors suggest that pain persists for 30 to 60 percent of individuals, even years after the expected healing period following the completion of treatment. In fact, in a 2008 study published in the Cancer Journal, a large comprehensive cancer center in the U.S. estimated that approximately 40 percent of visits to their pain and palliative care program were from survivors experiencing chronic pain after treatment. Factors associated with persistent pain in adult survivors have been comprehensively examined and include things such as transition from acute to chronic pain after surgery, particularly after breast or limb amputation surgery, exposure to neurotoxic chemotherapeutic agents like platinums or taxanes, radiation toxicity, as, and these um, have been associated with lower psychological and physical functioning. Research on pain in survivors of childhood cancer has lagged behind the adult literature, um, but new research has emerged suggesting that pain may be a problem in this population as well. Last year, Nicole Alberts, who's a psychologist and faculty member at St. Jude's, led a topical review on pain and survivors of childhood cancer that was published in Pain. In this review, they included 38 studies examining pain in childhood cancer survivors. The prevalence of pain in the studies they included um, ranged significantly, and half of the studies did not report prevalence rates. This wide range of pain estimates is likely due to the methodological quality um, of pain assessment in the studies. Um, it was often poor, for example, just assessing whether pain was present or absent um, and not using validated multidimensional pain assessments, which we know are best practice. Findings are also inconsistent regarding whether childhood cancer survivors are at increased risk for pain relative to controls. And that also, um, I think, speaks to some methodological challenges in terms of the control groups that are used, whether it's sibling controls, general population controls, etc. Um, very few studies included in the review examined factors associated with pain in childhood cancer survivorship. Um, Overall, they found that survivors reporting pain were more likely to experience symptoms of emotional distress, and pain was also associated with poor health-related functioning, such as with body image and health-related quality of life. Overall, this review found that the prevalence and nature of pain is really unclear in childhood cancer survivors and factors associated with pain have been really scarcely examined, particularly given what we know from the broader pediatric pain and adult cancer survivorship literature. Based on what we know about the development and maintenance of pain from the broader pediatric pain and adult cancer survivor literature, there's likely a combination of biological, psychological, and social factors associated with pain in childhood cancer survivorship. Biologically, sensory processing pathways may be altered for some childhood cancer survivors and may make them more sensitive to pain. So for instance, we know that exposure to neurotoxic drugs, surgery, and radiation can cause nerve damage, which can result in changes in sensory processing. Also, the pediatric pain literature has demonstrated that when children are exposed to repeated painful exposure, painful experiences, such as needle procedures, they can become sensitized to future pain. And this is particularly relevant in the context of childhood cancers, given the high volume of painful procedures associated with cancer-related treatments. To put this in perspective, in a rather old but classic study examining parent and child behavior in the context of painful procedures, um, the authors recruited children with cancer receiving out patient blood work. On average, the patients in that study had previously undergone 93 venipunctures and some had undergone as many as 300. 
Psychologically, there's been some really interesting theories that have come out in the past year proposing factors um, such as the meaning that survivors attribute to pain um, might impact how common and distressing pain is for them. For instance, the Cancer Threat Interpretation Model was published in 2017 by Lauren Heathcote, who's now based at Stanford, and Chris Eccleston from the University of Bath. Um, this uh, model is centered around the idea that survivors might be hypervigilant to signs of pain in their body for fear that pain might mean that their pan cancer has returned. And this may make everyday pains that come up more common and interfering. This theory suggests that when a cancer survivor senses pain in their body, they in either interpret that pain as a threat of cancer or not. If they do interpret this pain as threatening, they may engage in a cycle of fear and worry um, that may lead to hypervigilance and biased attending to pain, which in turn will amplify the experience of pain. The model suggests that to alleviate the fear and worry, survivors will engage in behaviors that may be either adaptive or maladaptive, depending on the context and the severity of symptoms. So for example, um, clinic attendance or avoiding clinic attendance, depending on their, their coping style. Whether or not an individual interprets the pain as a threat might be impacted by a variety of factors, such as their disease history and, for instance, whether pain was an initial symptom that led to a diagnosis. Finally, it's important to consider the role of social factors in the development and maintenance of pain for children after cancer. Parents too have reported being fearful of what somatic sensations like pain may mean for their children who have survived cancer. We know from the pediatric pain, but also the broader anxiety literature, that when parents are fearful, children can also become fearful. This has been demonstrated in many areas, such as the development of needle fears, children's chronic pain, as well as specifically within the context of painful cancer-related procedures, such as lumbar puncture and bone marrow aspiration. So having reviewed the current literature on pain in childhood cancer survivors, um, it really suggests that the current literature base is limited by its focus on survey-based research, um, which has struggled with some methodological challenges, as well as its very early focus on factors associated with pain. Additionally, um, there's been a lot of conceptual models which have been developed in recent years, but these need to be, de these need to be evaluated empirically. Overall, we know very little about how childhood cancer survivors understand and define their pain, how they process pain and other sensory input, and the factors that may play a role in this. So to address these gaps, I put together an international team of experts in pain and in oncology, um, including clinicians, researchers, as well as patient and parent partners. And I received a grant from the Nova Scotia Health Research Foundation to start a program of research in this area for my dissertation. My dissertation overall is focused on understanding the pain experience in childhood cancer survivors and the various biological, psychological, and social factors that may play a role using both qualitative and lab-based experimental pain methods. So the first study that I'm gonna to describe today is an interpretive phenomenological analysis, which examined the lived experience of pain after childhood cancer. Uh, we entitled this study, uh, When a Headache is Not Just a Headache, a Qualitative Examination of Parent and Child Experiences of Pain After Childhood Cancer, um, which I hope will become clear as I go through the results. Um, this study is complete and um, we just submitted a revision for publication, so hopefully it'll be out in published form soon. Um, and we'll jump into it. Uh, so the objective of this study was to explore childhood cancer survivors' experiences of pain from their perspective and the perspective of their parents. In this study, I conducted in-depth, semi-structured interviews with 10 childhood cancer survivors who had been treated at the IWK Health Center, as well as one of their parents. 
children were eligible to take part in this study if they were um, between the ages of 8 and 18 at the time of participation, were previously diagnosed with any cancer, had completed cancer-related treatment, and had not experienced a recurrence or a secondary cancer. We analyzed the data using interpretive phenomenological analysis according to the standard procedures. Um, I do want to note that we had two patient partners involved in this study, Maya Stern and Julia McLeod, and they played really crucial roles um, in this study from the conceptualization of the research question to the development of the interview guides, to logistics of recruitment, and as well as thinking about how to package and present the results. Um, in our lab in general, um, we've really moved to a model of um, involving patients in research and it's really transformed my thinking about the research process and it's enriched the work that we do. So I just really wanted to give them a shout out for their contributions to this. Um, so as I mentioned, we used interpretive phenomenological analysis for this study. It's a well-established um, qualitative method that seeks to understand human lived experience and the meaning that individuals ascribe to their experiences. IPA views human experience as a really complex, multidimensional phenomenon that's influenced by an individual's cognitive, affective, and social worlds. Um, and part of why we selected um, this framework for this study is because I think that's really fitting for pain research, given what we know about biopsychosocial influences on pain and what I had just presented. Um, IPA is regarded as a particularly valuable methodology for investigating novel areas of inquiry and phenomena that are inherently complex and emotionally laden. And so the study of childhood cancer survivorship, I think, really um, lends itself well to IPA, given the early state of research in this area and the inherently subjective and embodied nature of pain in human experience. Something I also really like about IPA is that um, it's committed to the ideographic, which means that it's concerned with capturing not only the similarities across individuals' experiences, but also the differences in the way that individuals assign meaning to a common or shared experience. And that's really important for a phenomenon like pain, which is um, really an individual and subjective experience. So as I mentioned, 10 parent uh, child dyads participated. And this sample size is in line with best practices for IPA given its ideographic focus. Children were on average 13 years old, but they ranged from eight to 17 years. They were diagnosed when they were about six and had been off treatment for about five and a half years. Children in the sample had a variety of diagnoses, including brain tumor, leukemia, bone and soft tissue sarcomas, lymphoma, and liver and kidney tumors, which we purposefully sought so that we could get a broad range of experiences. The analyses revealed three interrelated themes present in the data for children and parents. And the three themes are pain as a changed experience for children after cancer, pain as a threat, and appraisal of the cancer experience. And so for the purpose of this presentation, I'm gonna provide a broad overview of these themes with a few illustrative quotes. So for the first theme, almost all survivors and their parents reflected on how their perception of painful sensations had changed after cancer. And this was reflected by changes in the frequency of pain that they experienced, their ability to perceive pain. So for instance, some had an altered ability to perceive pain due to chemotherapy induced nerve damage, as well as their tolerance for pain. Almost all survivors and their parents expressed that the intensity and frequency of pain that they experienced during treatment has made many of the pains they experienced in survivorship feel insignificant in comparison. So for instance, as one mother said, pain is so different for her. I mean, when you have your abdomen cut open and all your organs taken out, when you get a splinter, it's no big deal. Central to the experience of pain and cancer survivorship was the idea of pain as a sign of bodily threat. 
Almost all survivors described instances where they interpreted bodily pain as a potential indication of a cancer recurring or a potential late effect or a secondary cancer. And this seemed to occur most often in the context of new or ambiguous sensations. So as one survivor said, most of the time I know what it is, but like if it's a pain that I've never gotten before, then I'll worry about it. Parents also worried about what their child's pain could mean. As this father said, son has been having mild headaches the last couple days. And as you know, that's how it all started 10 years ago. So a headache is not just a headache. Parents also described a sense of hypervigilance surrounding their child's pain. So for instance, the father went on to say, my wife picks up on every little clue. She says to me, he just looks off. He's not acting like he normally acts. And in a family of a child who had cancer, we perceive things differently and it can be a struggle. This hypervigilance seemed to be driven by parents' habit of needing to watch for signs of potentially life-threatening adverse events for their children during treatment, but also for being on high alert now for signs that um, could turn their worlds upside down again, like a cancer recurrence or a serious late effect. The way parents interpret and respond to their children's pain is also important because children reported looking to their parents for help with interpreting their pain and deciding what to do. So as this survivor said, I sometimes worry that the pain in my legs means my cancer is back and then I'm scared. But then I ask my mom and it depends on what she says. And then I say, okay, or yikes or whatever. Finally, the third theme, um, appraisal of the cancer experience. Children's and parents' perceptions of pain and survivorship seem to occur within the broader context of the meaning that they attach to their cancer experience. Children seem to appraise their experiences through a relatively neutral or objective lens. Um, and this seemed to foster feelings of resilience and self-efficacy despite living with pain or other late effects. And as one youth said, well, occasionally I will have pain in my arm, but most times I try and keep my arm a little elevated and use my good arm to my advantage. This is in contrast to parents who seem to attach a significantly more threatening and emotionally charged meaning to their child's illness. They described a grave sense of sadness and helplessness about their child experiencing pain and other limitations in survivorship. So as this mother said, just knowing son's condition, he's probably always going to have these issues. He will always probably have a sore back. He has compression fractures that are probably always going to plague him. So the cancer experience really seemed to play an important role in shaping children's and parents' experiences of pain and survivorship. Um, and this study provides preliminary support for what I described in terms of the cancer threat interpretation model. So in this study, we found that new or ambiguous pains are interpreted by childhood cancer survivors as threatening um, and result in behavioral consequences like seeking medical care for some children and their parents. But the, the results also expand the model in various ways. So for instance, many children and their parents discussed how they feared that pain um, could mean something other than recurrence, an outcome like late effects or fear of a secondary cancer. Um, the model also talks about how threatening interpretations of pain and cancer survivorship are likely driven by individuals' experiences with pain at diagnosis and during treatment. And while some participants did indeed express that threatening interpretations of pain um, happened because pain was a symptom that preceded their diagnosis, hence the title of um, the paper, When a Headache is Not Just a Headache, this wasn't universally true. 
Um, an, an interesting observation is that the only youth who participated in the study who became emotional when discussing pain as a potential sign of recurrence or, or late effects um, was diagnosed and treated in infancy and therefore they would have had no first-hand memories of their symptoms before and during treatment. And so I think this really speaks to the potential influence of narratives that are created for children by their parents and healthcare professionals, as well as the meaning that they learn to attach to cancer and pain over the course of their childhood. The study offers novel data to inform quantitative studies in this area, and I've already put this to use for the lab-based experimental pain component of my dissertation. So for instance, there's currently no comprehensive validated instruments to measure fear of cancer recurrence in children, which may um, be surprising given um, how large of a field it is for adults. Um, and this really came out as an important concept in this study. So the results from this qualitative study have helped us um, develop a new measure that we're using to assess fear of recurrence in children. And it's also guided the selection of other predictors of pain-related outcomes that we're using in the experimental pain study. And finally, the results also speak um, to the role of clinician communication regarding pain monitoring after childhood cancer. Parents discussed how their sense of vigilance to their child's pain was driven by their need to monitor their child's symptoms, such as pain, while they were on active treatment, and also their sense of responsibility to actively monitor for signs of recurrence now. And so this is an area where healthcare professionals can intervene by providing appropriate anticipatory guidance related to pain and symptom monitoring once treatment is over. So to follow up on this work, I'm conducting a lab-based experimental pain study using quantitative sensory testing to evaluate pain and sensory processing in childhood cancer survivors and to examine the contribution of various biological, psychological, and social factors. And this really helps us move beyond what we currently know about pain in childhood cancer survivorship, which has primarily uh, been examined using brief screening questionnaires. Um, and it brings us to a more comprehensive, mechanism-driven um, assessment of pain. Quantitative sensory testing is a non-invasive and ethically acceptable method um, that we use to assess sensation and pain thresholds um, that, that correspond to various nerve fibers and nervous system pathways. Um, so quantitative sensory testing tasks involve um, the application of various stimuli like heat, cold, or mechanical um, to assess sensory detection and threshold. In the top picture on this screen um, is a thermode which we use to assess heat and cold pain thresholds. We attach the thermode to the participant's skin and the thermode is controlled by a computer um, which increases and decreases the temperature. The, in the bottom picture is an instrument called a pin prick, um, which in real life looks like a mechanical pencil with a sharp end. And they come in a set um, in a series of ascending weights. Um, and we use that to assess mechanical pain thresholds. Uh, interest in QST originally grew from a movement to better understand um, diagnosis and mechanisms of neuropathic pain and to help guide um, clinical intervention in that area. And it's a methodology that's used clinically, predominantly in neurology, um, to complement and extend um, base bedside uh, neurological examinations. In the pain literature, QST has significantly advanced our understanding of both the neurobiological mechanisms and psychosocial influences that underpin typical and atypical sensory processing in adults. Um, and this has played an important role in the identification and refinement of tailored pain therapies. As an experimental pain methodology, QST um, allows for us to get a better understanding of the mechanisms of pain sensory deficits and hyperexcitability. 
It also helps us to differentiate between different types of pain uh, based on the modality of either above or below normative values. Um, in terms of an experimental procedure, it allows us to control for factors such as the position of the stimuli, so you can stimulate different areas of the body, um, the temperature and the duration of the stimuli um, to address various research questions about pain that would otherwise be impossible to examine in the real world and that can't be captured um, through questionnaire and survey data. QSD has been used to understand pain mechanisms in a number of clinical pediatric populations like juvenile idiopathic arthritis, functional abdominal pain, and children who were born premature. Um, there are published normative values for quantitative sensory testing for both adults and children um, from the German Research Network on Neuropathic Pain. Um, and so this is really helpful for researchers who wish to, be, to conduct um, between group comparisons. So we're currently recruiting for a study where we're using QST to understand childhood cancer survivors' patterns of sensory processing and different predictors, including biological variables like diagnosis and treatment information, psychological variables guided by what, guided by what we learned in the qualitative component, as well as social variables, so the impact of parents. We've run our first few participants through the protocol and we're looking to recruit about 60 in total for the study. Um, we'll be sharing social media posts on our Center for Pediatric Pain Research Facebook page and as well as across Twitter so watch for those coming soon um, and I hope to be able to share the results with you um, hopefully in the next year or so. Um, so before we end off um, I just want to recap what we covered today. So in this presentation, um, we um, learned about the current literature on pain and childhood cancer survivorship. I shared study um, findings from our new study on the lived experiences of pain after childhood cancer. And we explored the application of an experimental pain paradigm, quantitative sensory testing, um, to understand pain in childhood cancer survivors. Um, so I just want to thank my supervisor, Dr. Christine Chambers, Robin for inviting me and for her guidance and mentorship and support, and the many, many collaborators and partners and funders who have made this work possible. And I am happy to take any questions. <laughs>